Okay, so in this uh, last section, I'm going to talk about um, combustion properties, um, the different um, future um, uh, fuels, and how that's all challenging um, gas turbine designers, and also atomization. And um, this is obviously quite critical um, from an automotive point of view, um, more so than a gas turbine point of view, um, because achieving good atomization has quite a big impact on the combustion and to do that in the time scales that are available is uh, quite challenging. Okay, so um, the fuel composition can have significant impact on the combustion properties, and primarily one of the um, uh, properties that has an impact on is the flame speed, and um, that can kind of be shown. I can show you um, with a couple of examples here. So what you're looking at here is um, this is a combustion of uh, pure hydrogen. So you can see the electrodes in the image um, here. This is a, a mixture of um, hydrogen and air. And um, when they spark, you can see this flame front moving across the screen. Uh, this is actually taken using um, what, a technique called Schlieren. And what it does is you shine a light through your um, your sample and you um, set up a camera and basically a knife aid edge. And what happens is, as the um, where you have a uh, large uh, gradients in temperature you also have large gradients in density and that actually bends light so you can see that as a shadow on the um, thing so you can see the flame front as a shadow because you've got say large gradient in temperature and large gradient in density so that's what you're looking at um, so in here you can obviously see it you know expanding out quite quickly and you can also see all this instabilities taking place as the flame starts to wrinkle um, as it's traveling um, quite quickly now, if you can compare that, if you can compare that to a uh, um, a mixture of 50-50 um, um, hydrogen and methane, now I've started them at the same time, so you can just see the difference in terms of flame speed between these two uh, mixtures. So, um, hydrogen is obviously burns very quickly, and although this uh, mixture here is much faster um, compared to 100% methane, it's obviously a lot slower than 100% hydrogen. And you also notice in terms of the flame, this is much more laminar. There's none of that wrinkling or uh, turbulence that you can see in the hydrogen one. So, well, what impact does that have in terms of a gas turbine designer? Well, kind of quite a lot as it happens, because um, the future fuels that um, we're looking at, um, so some of the fuels, and we'll talk about them later, that we get from anaerobic, digestion and um, different sources can have quite large quantities of hydrogen in them and um, so you've just seen the, by changing the um, composition of hydrogen in the fuel can change the uh, flame speed dramatically and if you've designed your combustor to run on just methane for example and then suddenly you double the flame speed that means you can have uh, couple of problems it can um, you have input proper location of the flame front you have different temperature profiles it can overheat um, increase the vibration levels it just depends what's going on in the combustor um, in a gas turbine uh, you typically have um, soil combustion is um, typically used so that's why um, these this is a soil combustor in these images and that's why it's this sort of conical shape because the as the airs coming out of this burner, it's swirling around as it exits, it forms that cone. So you can see methane, um, this is uh, coke oven gas, which has um, obviously got a lot, of uh, a lot of methane, a lot of hydrogen in it, but also um, some carbon monoxide. And um, this is an example of the sort of thing that can happen depending on your fuel. So if you increase the, um, uh, the flame speed um, without changing any of the burner characteristics, you can get flashbacks. So instead of the flame burning outside the burner, which is where you want it to, it's f the the flame burns faster than the velocity of the than the bulk velocity of the um, gas that's coming out of the burner. So it flashes back to where it can into the side of the burner, and that can obviously uh, cause uh, damage to the burner. So overheat the insides and melt it or whatever um, uh, can cause problems. The opposite is is also a problem that if you um, change it for a gas which has slower burning characteristics, then the flame can what's called blow off. So 
the bolt velocity of the um, of the fluid coming through the the burner is higher than the burning velocity, so the flame just lifts off and it can't sustain combustion and it goes out. If that's in terms of a gas turbine, obviously that's bad news, um, especially if it was a uh, you know used in aviation. So all these things need to be taken into account when we're looking at fuel. So now the challenge is to develop these um, flexi fuel burners that can run on a you know quite a range of uh, fuel uh, compositions. Okay, so in terms of atomization, so that was kind of more aimed at um, the gas turbine um, sector. We're looking now from an automotive sector, both um, gasoline or diesel. So fundamentally, um, what is atomization? Well, it's the disintegration of a bolt liquid down into smaller droplets. That's what it fundamentally is. But, and the overall aim is to reduce the mean um, droplet diameter, because what happens if you do that? Where you have a higher re, uh, heat release rate, rate, it's easier to light up. You have a much wider burning range, and also, most importantly, you can lower pollutant emissions. If you think about this, if you have a um, a small droplet, a small droplet has a much higher um, area to vo surface area to volume ratio than a than a larger droplet, and it's only the fuel on the surface of the droplet that can be uh, evaporated. So you want to have that highest, the highest um, surface area to volume ratio to promote evaporation, to promote um, combustion. So that's why you want a uh, smaller diameter as possible. And to improve atomization, sort of um, throughout the years, many different types of injectors have been developed for automotive applications. Some are still in use today, um, some aren't. So the one that probably is still in use today is the multi-hole injector. And so all of these images just show a still of a kind of sideways um, look at a... It's using a technique called shadowography. So basically there's a backlight behind the injector, the camera's in front of the injector, and shining light through, and you'll see in the shadow of what's being cast. Uh, so you can see that for this diesel injector, there's... Um, I can't remember how many holes on this. I think it's five or six. But you can see there's um, the fuel's coming out, sort of almost like fingers from um, the pintle of the injector. Uh, this pressure swirl um, technology was used um, in GDI engines fairly recently, although they moved start moving away from this now. And this type of um, spray was caused by basically swirling the um, fuel inside the injector. Um, so as the fuel comes out of the pintle, a tangential moment is imparted to it. The fuel starts swirling as it comes out. And what that means is because you've imparted a tangential and radial velocity to the fluid, rather than just an axial and radial fluid, um, it, it breaks up, but um, it's got a much higher relative air um, velocity relative to the air. So that aids atomization, helps break up this spray without significantly increase in the penetration of the spray. Another way of doing this was um, to use air assist. Um, this isn't used um, to my knowledge in the, anymore in the automotive industry but basically uses a separate air, compressed air system to inject air along with the fuel and basically use the energy of that injected air to, um, to uh, strip and shred the uh, the liquid fuel and to help atomize it. But obviously this means you need a separate compressed air system and then the, the inefficient, inefficiencies of um, having that system on board means that um, it's not it's not worth it. Although this is kind of how it's done in the aviation industry. They actually use some of the air through the nozzle to, to help assist atomization. The final one is a fan, um, which is basically like a slit. So you've got a nice fan shape and if you were look at it um, side on this way it'd be quite thin um, this this isn't you know used now so mainly multi-hole or um, some derivation of the pressure swirl technique using uh, slightly different geometries so this is what's actually going on inside the injector so I talked about the pencil on the previous slide and what's actually happening there so 
you have a fuel hose connected to the back of the injector we have a filter because um, you don't they're very tight tolerances in here and you don't want any um, dirt or anything getting in here and clogging up the injector and hampering its performance um, the spray tip is obviously down here and there's a plunger in there now um, the injector is um, connected to the ECU for an electrical attachment and when the ECU um, depending on the speed the engine speed and the throttle position will send an electrical signal to the injector that will um, activate or deactivate the solenoid you can see it turning on and off here when the solenoid turns on that retracts the plunger which then opens a pathway which allows the pressurized fuel to flow past the plunger um, and out through the spray tip now there are other ways of doing this um, piezo electric inject um, injectors are becoming more uh, widespread now but this is pretty you know um, tried and tested technology um, by using a, a solenoid and just to give you an idea of um, some of the engineering challenges in terms of um, this injector the pressures now um, for diesel injectors are um, well in excess now of 2000 bar um, but just to give you an idea um, 2000 bar of pressure would be the pressure exerted by a um, standard family saloon if you were to balance it on the tip of your little finger that's the sort of pressures you're talking about the the spray tip um sorry the the quantity of fuel that comes out the, the thing can range from between one to 35 millimeters cubed and that's from the head of a pin to the size of a raindrop which is quite a significant range when you think about it the tolerances inside the um the injector well they're down to two microns uh sort of tolerance and they the diameter of uh, average human hair is 60 microns so gives you an idea of the uh the, the engineering that's going into this thing and then you've all got to do all that within um uh less than the blink of an eye so it takes you 250 milliseconds quarter of a second to blink your eye and typically the duration of these injectors between one and two milliseconds maybe a bit more just depends on the obviously depends on the engine individual engine characteristics so you can see there's a lot of technology that goes into these things even though they might seem fairly simple in their construction so to put the also to put the um the size of the um fuel into uh, into context the the typical drop size for fuels range from sort of sub micron um so less than one micron up to kind of um 10 uh, sort of 20 30 40 micron something like that um they have a range of droplet sizes but putting that in context raindrops are up in the sort of um thousand micron range um dust mites um around sort of 100 microns clouds 50 microns so you're talking about the size of smoke and red blood cells is kind of fuel droplet size range <clears throat> now one thing that's important to understand from injector is um really you want to uh, inject fuel of a known size because then you can design your combustion chamber to deal with that but because of the mechanics of the injecting the fuel into the chamber you always end up with a range of sizes and here's an um, example of a, a typical this is a pressure swirl atomizer and you can see it injecting so you can see the um, the end of the injector there the orifice and the fuel coming out and you wouldn't see what's happening so this this whole event is one and a half milliseconds but you can see it because it's been filmed at 30,000 uh, frames per second and slowed down for you and what's going on in here is if you if you um, measure the if you measure the um, uh, diameters of all the droplets in here and then plot that so you have droplet diameter along here and then if you do it by number which is the dotted line so that's by number so you can see if you were to take the mean you'd say oh it's around about 10 microns something like that but the solid line shows the mass and you can see that there's this shift this kind of d cubed shift now the reason for that is is that 
although there's lots of um, uh, there are lots of small droplets by number so almost half the spray is contained within um, droplet diameters less than about five or six microns it's the mass that's swaying this because uh, obviously d cubed is proportional to the mass so that even though these droplets are relatively few by number because they're they're relatively large when you cube them it means that they're a significant proportion of the volume now this is quite a challenge when you come to uh, um, in terms of the designer uh, or the design of injectors because you want a very narrow band but if if um, a significant proportion of your mass is contained within few droplets then this is going actually going to take quite a long time to vaporize in terms of your the context of the engine which is going to have a significant impact on emissions so just to kind of illustrate that a bit further i've kind of you know mocked up a um an example to show you so if we just consider this um glass is our spray volume okay so this is 100 percent of our spray and you can see that our spray has been um divided into four equal equal volumes okay um so we've got the, this raisin volume layer and rice lentils and couscous okay and if you spread them out then the raisins take up this area on a baking sheet the lentils take up this area the rice takes up a larger area and the couscous takes up a much larger area so hopefully what um what i'm trying to get across with this is that all of these are equal volumes but they have significantly different surface areas so in terms of vaporization and in terms of the um uh combustion and the resultant emissions in terms of the time scales that we have for the combustion to occur this kind of couscous is much much better it will vaporize within the time scales we have clean combustion better emissions but it's only a quarter of the spray a quarter of it is contained within these raisin uh, sized objects which aren't going to combust in time and going to contribute significantly to our um, undesirable emissions and this is a problem so this is where i go back to atomization is key it really is in that you've got to make sure that you can get um, uh, all of your fuel pro properly atomized to help ensure you have clean combustion okay thanks for listening that uh, concludes uh, this series uh, the um, session on combustion um, again, if there's any comments or queries, then uh, please do contact me. Thanks for listening.